Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program this evening, we have uh, Tyler Kuski, Fred Rouse, Sam Mornkin, and uh, Zachary Moore. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Very happy to have you here uh, on the, uh, the uh, morning after the uh, elections of uh, 2016, where, uh, contrary to almost everybody's predictions, the uh, winner of the presidency was Donald Trump. The only thing I have to say about that is this. The, the play, Springtime for Hitler, was a, an absolute smash. <laughs> the only question remaining is, will the producers uh, face uh, criminal, will, uh, will the producers be put in prison? Anybody care to take me on? Anybody know the allegory that I'm making there? No. Are you talking about <laughs> Mel Brooks movies? Yes. Or, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, you know, the whole thing looks to me like it was uh, preordained, but what do I know? Uh, well, I have heard that uh, Donald's been golfing with Rupert Murdoch weekly for the last couple months. So to, to, <laughs> to pretend that Donald is an outsider is um, a little crazy. Well, let's, let's talk about what is the significance of the seeming come from behind uh, victory of a guy who did everything he could to be outrageous both during the primary season and during the election, general election season and won anyway. Well, what? it certainly discredits the uh, belief or, uh, that was spread by Donald Trump that the elections are rigged and he was going to be rigged to lose. Well, he won. <laughs> Because if you guys, I don't know if you guys remember too much, but he he was saying a lot of statements that the elections are rigged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of conservatives and a lot of people on the right were believing this to be true, and uh, I think a lot of them even didn't even bother to vote. So obviously that discredits that because he won. Well, you, well, why vote in California? It didn't matter who you voted for here. Hopefully, you voted for a third-party candidate, be it Gary Johnson or Jill Stein in California. Well, not, not Jill Stein, but go on. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, Gary Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in California, it doesn't really, your vote really doesn't count. Uh, Which brings up the whole issue of the Electoral College. And, of course, the, uh, the left uh, are holding uh, demonstrations, uh, uh, Soros-sponsored riots <laughs> in Portland, in Seattle, in uh, San Francisco, Oakland, uh, New York, pretty much anywhere there's a large city, there are buses nearby where, uh, where uh, uh, protesters have been bussed in to uh, wave their pre-manufactured signs around and say, we reject the president-elect and, and break car windows. Um, the, the left is really, really angry. For I'm not sure why, but they are. And a lot of people do this, in those protests, uh, someone, someone came out with some studies saying that 70% of the people in, of the arrests in... I think it's Portland. The mm -hmm. protesters there, the, 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 of the ones that are arrested, 70% of them didn't vote. <laughs> Out of state and, you know. Well, if you, wa if you watch the liberal media, too, uh, up until the election, often they would say, well, there's a huge electoral advantage for Hillary Clinton on the Electoral College map. And there's many paths to victory for her using the Electoral College. And now that they've lost, they're sort of sour grapes. Now Barbara Boxer is saying, let's get rid of the Electoral College. Yes, it's uh, the ultimate, you know, uh, throwing a hissy fit and slamming the board game onto the ground uh, after you've lost. Um, but I think the Electoral College is actually important because it balances out uh, states to versus direct democracy. We, we live in a republic, and so we send people to do our government work, we don't uh, vote in direct democracy, and that's what they would have us do for president. And the Electoral College give, protects us by uh, implementing what we call federalism, where you have federal government, state government, local government divided up so that one does not come so powerful to take away all of our liberties. And yeah, that's they're all powerful. Yeah. yeah. Well, one, one of the arguments, of course, against d direct democracy is that direct democracy is nothing more than two wolves and a sheep footing on who is going to be lunch. And uh, the federal system gets away from that, pro that problem to a certain extent by uh, making it, as you pointed out, not all the power is vested in one body. We've got three branches of government and so forth and so on. Um, the uh, question that I have as far as the 
the Gary Johnson campaign is this. We looked at two candidates, Donald Trump with the highest negatives of any Republican candidate, general election candidate at least, uh, in memory, and Hillary Clinton with, uh, with the, the highest negatives of any Democratic candidate uh, in, in history, both richly deserved, both flawed candidates, any way you want to look at it, uh, and uh, both you know, just very bad uh, in, you know, in numerous different ways. We looked at Gary Johnson, who's a nice guy, two-term governor of a uh, uh, Dem Republican governor in a Democratic state, running mate, same thing, two-term governor in a, in a Democratic state, Bill Well, uh, both presentable, both, uh, you know, none, none of the personal baggage that, uh, that, uh, that followed around both Trump and Hillary, yet he was only able to pull out 3% of the vote when the final analysis came, uh, when the final vote came down. What is it about voting tribally almost, voting Democratic or Republican, what is it that drives that, that dynamic? Was it because Gary Johnson failed, or was it because we're just used to the two-party dynamic? Anybody? I think it has a lot more to do with the two-party system. Uh, with libertarians, unfortunately, there's been a bit of a branding issue that libertarians have been branded as losertarians. Uh, I mean... It, Running for almost any political position as a libertarian is very risky and very dangerous. In fact, uh, even if you're running for nonpartisan, you almost want to hide the fact that you're libertarian. You, you, you want to, because that discredits you. Because and it's not that people dislike libertarians or don't agree with libertarians; is they view that view that libertarians is not a party that can win. They view that libertarians, yeah, I agree with the philosophy, I agree with everything, and I talk to people all the time. They say, "Oh, I love libertarians, but I'm not going to vote libertarian because they're always going to lose." And and unfortunately, if everybody who said that would vote libertarian, we win, but... Well, yeah, it's the same attitude that everybody that said uh, McClintock was a better candidate than Schwarzenegger back when he was running for governor. Uh, but he couldn't win. But Yeah, but he can't win, but, but and he didn't because people that liked him better voted for Schwarzenegger because they thought he could win. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's that dynamic, even though it's not a party and situation it, in that case. It is a very strange dynamic because if you look at, uh, you know, the 2000 to, to 2008, you have the failure of the Republican Party. I mean, it was it was clear. And then you see with Obama and uh, 2008, 2016, you see the failure of the Democrat Party. So you'd think that, you know, the American people would have a appetite for something new because they've watched, you know, over these last many years, the, the complete failure of administration of government by both major political parties. And so where is the, the appetite for the alternative? And I don't know where that is. I, I wish I had the answer to that. I would say that the, the bright spot and this is completely contrary to family members and friends believe that we are divided and we need to have faith in our institutions the media and we have to have, you know trust the system that we have now otherwise we're doomed and i would say the exact opposite i would say that the great benefit of the election campaign that we just lived through is that we have less trust and less faith in the media, in the political process. We all see that it's a joke. It's yeah, you manipulated. Know, I, and I think that's good. I think that skeptic, <laughs> healthy skepticism bordering on cynicism is a good thing. And that could lead in the future to more votes for third party candidates. Um, Gary Johnson, nice guy, like you said, but maybe he wasn't the best. Maybe well, Weld should have been on the top of the ticket. Yeah. Maybe, I mean, Ron Paul, gosh, Rand Paul. I, yeah, it's too bad. Well, it's interesting. We're looking at a situation right now where the economy has been anemically expanding since 2009, almost seven years now, or, or a full seven years. We're probably at the uh, the apex of the uh, expansion, such as it is. We're probably looking at a recession uh, slash depression coming on qu quite soon. It's going to happen under the watch, as far as the general public is concerned, of Republicans controlling the White House, the Congress, Senate, both both Senate and and the legislative branch, and and also uh, with appointments now uh, by a Democratic uh, Senate and President or a Republican Senate and President, the Supreme Court is going to continue to have a conservative uh, slant. So, with that being the case. With Republicans presiding over what will almost certainly, no matter what they do, be economic decline and economic uh, stress, will that spell possibly the end of the Republican Party and leave uh, an opening for libertarians 
or a less savory party to uh, step in where the Republicans have failed. Well, I, I get the sense that the well's already being poisoned this, this very moment. You know, he's not even in uh, office, just, just with, for example, the riots, you know, trying to, trying to spike the amount of uh, animosity towards Trump just to guarantee that he can't do what he says he's going to do. And I, what I see is the gears are in motion and it's all, I mean, the writing is on the wall. We have massive entitlement spending. We've got massive pension obligations. These are not the fault of the Democrats or Republicans. It's the fault of the big and ever-growing government. And well, the no, it's, a, it's, a, it's the fault of the people who voted for both Democrats and Republicans. Right. <clears throat> So I mean, we have voted for the people that brought the ruinous entitlement programs. And right. The ruinous and so the question is, does the public, or do we lean toward more government to solve our problems or do we lean toward the reality of our problems were caused by the giant colossus that we've, you know, perpetrated on ourselves for all these years? And can we wake up to that fact? Can we wake up to the reality that we can't afford Medicare. We can't afford Social Security. We cannot afford CalPERS in California. I mean, we're going to go broke quicker than Chicago. We're so broke, it's incredible. <coughs> so how do you, will people face that reality? I mean, I, mean, I can't. I, I don't think people realize the reality. When I tell people the two-thirds of the federal budget is transfer payments, Medicare, Medi-Cal, Social Security, uh, welfare, and the interest on the debt, when I tell people that two, that takes up two-thirds of the budget, people call me a liar and say it's all defense. It, but that's the fact. Right. People just don't realize it. Right. Now, is there, a room, is there room for optimism uh, with the Trump administration? They ran as a, a, a populist, nativist, uh, misogynist, you know, all of the, all of the uh, labels ho foisted upon uh, Trump by the, uh, by the National Review and by the left are, are all accurate. But looking at who he is appointing or who he is considering appointing to the various cabinet positions. We're looking at a chief of staff, Reince Priebus, already named, establishment as you can get, former chair of the Republican National Committee. We're looking at uh, senior counselor to the president. That one's controversial, Steve Bannon from Breitbart, uh, the so-called alt-right. That's, you know, causing a big stir, but that's probably more of a loyalty and more of a, uh, he's a good, com good communication manager type uh, person, uh, I think. So that, that's understandable. But looking at some of the rest that are being named or, or talked about, for Secretary of State, not named yet, but the people, who are, the people who are in contention are John Bolton, awful. Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani, awful. Uh, Bob Corker, not so sure about where he stands. Newt Gingrich, who might be a halfway decent, uh, who knows. Uh, and Mitt Romney, of all people, is now being talked about for Secretary of State. And Mitt Romney, during the, the primaries, uh, was probably the worst enemy of, yeah. uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of Trump. So the establishment... Toyed with the idea of endorsing Johnson. Never did. Maybe that's why. So the establishment is creeping in rather quick. I wouldn't even call it creep. It's happening right in front of our faces that um, Donald Trump, who got a lot of votes from people like me who believed our problem is our interventionism overseas, our um, foreign entanglements, our wars, our relationship with NATO, our, you know, picking fights with Russia and China and all that. That's, in my view, as a libertarian, that's bad, bad news. Um, if you believe in free trade and you believe in peace, um, the establishment people such as John Bolton and Rudy Giuliani and even Mitt Romney are pushing, I mean, these people are pro-war. They're, 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 yeah, they're pro-war. Pro yeah. Now, to be fair, uh, Hillary was proven pro-war. I mean, she started right. a war in Libya. Uh, we came, we saw he died, speaking of Gaddafi. She was a, you know, a warmonger par excellence. She got us involved uh, to the extent that we are in Syria and Afghanistan and all of the rest it never ended. It's the longest war we've had ongoing. The Obama administration, where she was Secretary of State, uh, she didn't do anything about it. So we know that she was a warmonger. Uh, no question about it. Trump, open question. 
He threw out the name of John Bolton. Is he? Is that a negotiating uh, position for him? Is he throwing out somebody, uh, uh, you know, just a, a red, uh, a bloody uh, hanky to say, okay, well, I won't uh, nominate him after all. I'll nominate somebody that's a little bit more palatable, like Mitt Romney or somebody that you know people think is a nice guy. As far as I'm concerned, none of them are palatable. I mean, they all represent that neoconservative wing of the Republican Party. He's, that, not, he's not nominating uh, uh, Ron Paul. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, and you'd like to see some counterbalance in there, uh, you know, at least somebody who shares the views he expressed during the campaign, skepticism of foreign invention, uh, you know, adventurism. And the fact that he's going to bring in all these neoconservatives, I fear we may have, you know, the novice George W. Bush who took office with the Paul Wolfowitzes, the Dick Cheneys in there. And when the opportunity came to Im implement the neoconservative agenda, they took it. And I fear that the same thing may happen with the President Trump if some sort of situation were to present itself. These neoconservatives may push him to do he something. He may not be quite as naive as George W. Bush was. Possibly. He's a, he may be a, well, they were both strong personalities, but he's in, in some ways a <coughs> novice. And, yeah. you know, I don't, I, I don't like the idea that everybody in his administration is going to be from the neoconservative bent. Let's see some balance. Let's see somebody who has those anti-war views. What about Treasury Secretary? We're looking at Stephen Mnuchin and uh, Jamie Dimon, of all people. Jamie Dimon, uh, uh, head of, uh, which bank is, you know, one City of the Group? two, uh, no, not uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, I think. Oh, yeah. He's, you know, one of the biggest, too big to fail banks there is out there. Uh, somebody who, uh, whose bank was fined multi, I think, billions of dollars for malfeasance during the, during the, uh, the, the unpleasantness that happened in 2008, 2006, 7, 8. Uh, we're talking about total establishment, total bankster uh, nominations for Treasury. Is this, is, is, you know, when he ran essentially against Wall Street? We think the same thing would have, was going to happen with Hillary Clinton, anyways. So. Well, yeah, it would have been a given with Hillary Clinton. I mean, the Goldman Sachs speech, speeches where the transcripts weren't released. We knew, we knew I, that she. I think was it makes Hillary. sense to appoint someone who has been involved in banking for Treasury. So, but not somebody who is the, one of the the, 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 the leading pick, bad guys. We, we can argue that the, the pick from one of the major big banks is probably the, not the best pick, but it does make sense that he would pick somebody that's ran a big bank and that is willing to accept the position. Okay. One of the other things that, that Trump said during the campaign, uh, sort of half-heartedly at least, is that marijuana uh, uh, or cannabis uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, legislation should be left to the, or enforcement, whatever, should be left to the states. It should be a state issue, not a federal issue. But for Attorney General, he's talking about, again, his good bud, Rudy, Rudy Giuliani, Giuliani, Pam Bondi, uh, until he was discredited by Bridgegate, Chris Christie of all people. Now he's going to be nominated to be... Uh, uh, the uh, to the uh, the food courts uh, the supreme food court. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, do we have any hope that there will be any sensible uh, law enforcement? I appointment? think the main takeaway from the whole thing is that it doesn't really matter if you elect a Democrat or Republican. You're going to get pretty much a, um, establishment figures running the government. Um, at least the figureheads and the deep state, the people that run the State Department and the Treasury Department and all that, they're the same people. I mean, it's not going to change much. The military budget Trump's talking about, you know, wants to spend a bunch of money on new boats and new submarines yeah, and for new nuclear for defense, missiles. He's talking and, about and he's talking about infrastructure spending and he's talking about growing everything. For, um, for defense, stimulus he's spending. Yeah, for defense, he's talking about Kelly Ayad, Jeff Sessions, Michael Flynn. I don't think there's any, any real change in, in military spending coming down the pike anytime soon. Right. Okay. For, uh, here's, here's where I have a, a sliver of optimism. Uh, for Interior Secretary and for, uh, for let's, let's look at, uh, where is it here? Environmental Protection Agency. This is the one that really interests me. <laughs> the Environmental Protection Agency Administrator People that are being talked about include Joe Aiello, Jeffrey Homestead, and Myron Abel. Myron Abel is the head of the Competitive Enterprise Institute. He is a skeptic on global warming. He is a, uh, an avowed enemy of EPA uh, abusive enforcement of the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. That is encouraging to me. That's interesting. I think the, the biggest thing is he's got to pick his battles. What's the most important battle to win? Where do you where do you start? You know that swamp fights back. 
So what's the what's, alligators are numerous. Yes. Yeah. So where do you start? And where where would you, if you were uh, uh, whispering in 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 the oh. Donald's ear, where would you tell him to start? Uh, you know. Well, I think to me, I think you uh, <coughs> you go after the uh, the weakest enemy first, and you build your way up. And who would that be? Um, because the environmental movement is pretty strong politically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't know where. Luckily, I don't have that decision to make. <laughs> okay, well, I'd ahead. like to see, uh, you know, cabinet heads, uh, people that are going to be interested in, in deconstruction. So, you know, Trump's a big builder. He's a construction guy. What about deconstructing these departments? You know, somebody that's... Uh, bring in the wrecking ball. Yeah, bring in the wrecking ball. Somebody who's going to, you know, why do you need an interior department? You know, let's... Department let's, of Energy, <laughs> Department of Education. Well, department okay. of Education, I'm glad you brought that up. For <laughs> Department of Education, he's looking at Ben Carson uh, and Williamson Evers. And Williamson Evers ran as a libertarian for, for in California back in the day uh, and is... Uh, uh, philosophically libertarian and uh, in favor of charter schools, homeschools, you know, all the rest. Him as education secretary, that could be mind boggling in its uh, implications. All he has to do is do nothing. You know, <laughs> that's, that's the key. Or recommend firing half the, half the department and abolishing it, which I think, uh, you know, is not uh, totally out of the question so, yeah, the, in the Republican the, Congress. The, um the benefit of the election was skepticism in the media and in big government. And then, uh, unfortunately, we haven't gotten the gridlock that I always hoped for. I mean, ideally, we would have a Republican president and a Democratic Congress, so less got done, right? So um, solving problems by working together just results in more spending, bigger bureaucracy and and eventually more debt and so I don't see Republican control of the Senate and the House as a good thing I think it would be better if there was destructive opposition between well, the, the branches of government what about what about the Supreme Court nominee we worried for a long time that uh, a successor to Obama would uh, replace Scalia now that won't be the case there will be a Trump appointee to, to uh, replace Scalia and probably two or three other justices as they uh, age out or die on the bench. So do we have hope that we'll at least be able to salvage the Supreme Court for another generation or two? Well, the, the issue there, you know, George W. Bush had a, a couple choices and, you know, he chose John Roberts and we know how that worked out. Um, you know, it's all in the... Uh, John the Roberts was on health care was bad. On everything else, he's been halfway decent. Yeah, here and there, but the the healthcare you know issue is you know Huge. part of the reason you know maybe he's uh, Donald Trump's best friend in the sense because Obamacare I'm sure helped uh, Trump in those last weeks uh, get get to the White House. Yeah. Um, but you know you need somebody who you can trust to uh, scrutinize these possible justices and find out where they stand on the Constitution. Is Donald Trump up to that task? Is he going to be able to figure out if they're going to be a Stephen Breyer or if they're going to be? John Roberts on health care, or a lot of the or a suitor, or a suitor. Yeah. all these justices that suddenly um, convert to a big government mindset once they get on the bench, and you got to be able to sniff that out. And I don't know if Trump's going to be able to do that. He put out a list a list of uh, justice uh, nominees during the campaign. Uh, was the, did you see anybody on that list that you thought was was encouraging? I, no, I, I my pick would be a. a for a federal judge, I don't know about Supreme Court, would be a Timothy Sanderford or somebody <laughs> like that. I think we got to get him started at the lower court level and move him up to the Supreme Court. But well, he's, he's at the Goldwater now, and, and his uh, for, took the job that uh, uh, for, from a person who moved up to the Arizona Supreme Court. Exactly. So hopefully we're moving in the right direction there. Yeah. Well, one of the people that's being, uh, uh, being kicked around for a Supreme Court nominee is uh, and I'm forget I'm dropping I'm forgetting the name now the, the founder of, of PayPal. Uh, Elon Musk. What? Elon Musk. <coughs> Elon Musk. Yeah. Was... No, no, not Elon Musk. Founder of PayPal. Uh, the guy that uh, the came intercept. Out, yeah. The, no, the guy that came out and supported him loudly at the at the oh, okay. uh, Republican convention, whose name I've forgotten, but is a libertarian uh, yeah. in many respects. Uh, so that, you know that might be an interesting Supreme Court pick. Name is being kicked around. Um, Question, uh, you know, another question that comes up is, during the campaign, uh, Trump made a, a lot of noise about uh, send her to jail, referring to Hillary, uh, appoint a special prosecutor, or send the attorney general after her, or send the FBI after her. Well, the FBI uh, kind of pulled, you know, 
I don't know what they were doing. They were, they were trying to, to say that she was guilty as hell without actually uh, coming out and saying it aloud. Uh, it looked to me like, should the Trump administration go after Hillary for not only the email, but really more so for the, uh, the pay to play uh, foundation the, stuff, the, yeah. the Clinton Foundation stuff, which she is uh, and Bill are both probably uh, very prosecutable uh, on. Uh, would that be productive or counterproductive at this point? Might might alienate uh, Democrats. Well, of course, they're going to be they're alienated already. So that that may be one of those swamp draining activities best left for later, I believe. Well, I my view is the Department of Justice and you know the police power of the federal government is, is too broad. But there is one area where the Department of Justice and the federal government, in terms of police power, should be more active, and that's in government corruption. I'd really like to see most of the defendants brought to the courthouse by the federal government to be government officials. And so I would support a, an investigation into Hillary Clinton. And if, you know, if she broke the law, especially with the pay to play, that sends a message to people that, you know, this government's not for sale anymore. Sort and, of a, a message that we're not Colombia or Argentina. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause well, we've seen so often where, uh, you know, uh, high level politicians get off and they always get off. Um, but, I, I do think he, the first thing he's got to create is unity, and that's unity in the races, uh, unity between uh, political parties. If he wants to do anything, he's got to do that. So as much as he might like to, uh, to prosecute Hillary immediately, he probably should wait. One of the things that got him elected, got him traction to start with, and it was one of the most despicable things that he did, as far as I'm concerned, was go after illegal immigrants, go after the Mexicans, build the wall, uh, don't let any, uh, you know, deport all of the, all of the Muslims, uh, the Syrians, whatever. Basically, uh, just a, a hardcore, hard-boiled, uh, take no prisoners, nativist attitude toward immigration. And he's already backtracking on that. But that, that got him the vote of, mm -hmm. of the uh, people whose jobs were lost or have been lost over the, over the last uh, couple of decades in, in the Rust Belt. Uh, people, people realize that they don't have a job at the car plant or at the steel mill or at the uh, tire factory anymore. They don't really know why, but they think it's probably because those darn Mexicans took my job. Mm -hmm. That's not why, uh, as you know, under, you know, if we understand what's going on economically, it's more about automation. It's more about it's more about other factors. But the people that voted for Trump think it's immigration. Is he going to be able to deport the three million uh, Mexicans? Put up a wall that prevents uh, Muslims from uh, Middle Easterners from from uh, immigrating into the United States? Is any of that going to to happen, or is he going to really alienate all the people that uh, that he that voted for him? Quick answer, yes, no. He's going to probably spread out, uh, spread building the wall for the next 30 years. You know, it's, it's going to be an ongoing project that will never be finished. And we didn't talk about the infrastructure, but that'll put us in debt twice as much as we already are. It's a government project. It's never going to get done. <laughs> Thank you very much for being on the show. See you again next week, same time, same place, on the Libertarian Counterpoint.